Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program. My name is Maria Racina. I'm the library. I'm a librarian at Eleanor London Code St. Luke Library. And today we have a real treat for you, a Passover cooking workshop with the amazing Xenia Prince. For those of you who don't know her, Xenia is a Montreal food blogger, cookbook author, and photographer, as well as the voice behind popular food and lifestyle blog at the Immigrants Table. Today, Xenia will be walking us through three quick, three, <laughs> quick, easy and delicious Passover recipes. I will be here in the background in case anybody needs any tech support. So you can put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand. So without further ado, take it away, Xenia. Hello, can you guys hear me? Thumbs up, Maria, if you can hear me. Excellent, perfect. So hi everyone and welcome to our Passover themed live. So today, as Maria said, so my name is Ksenia Prince. Sorry, I'm gonna give you guys a spiel about me before we dive into the recipes. So my name is Ksenia Prince and I'm the food blogger and food photographer behind immigrantstable.com. It's a blog focused on healthy, beautiful international recipes that are meant to showcase the breadth of immigrant culture out there. I work a lot with Jewish recipes, but not just. Um, and I delve particularly into the story of my family, which has immigrated from the former Soviet Union to Israel, and now I find myself in Canada. So my food is a melange of all the different cultures to which I've been exposed, and somehow it usually turns out well. So today we're gonna be working with three of my favorite Passover recipes. We're gonna be working with uh, chocolate date balls, with pure, with uh, chocolate macaroon pyramids. Are you sensing a chocolate theme? And uh, the last but not least is going to be matzo crack, which also has chocolate in it. So all three of those things are surefire hits, some of our household favorites and have been favorites wherever we've made them for other people. So whether you're following along with a live or whether you're cooking from the recording at home, I hope that this, that this helps guide your recipe selection for Passover. Like I said, you're going to be getting all the recipes in print form following the workshop. You should have them in regular Word document for now. So again, if you want to cook with me, you're more than welcome. Now, we're going to get started with, uh, with prepping the matzo crack. The matzo crack is going to be cooking, in, baking in the oven, and then we will kind of reverse back our order and go back to the chocolate date balls. Once we're done the chocolate date balls, we're gonna take out the matzo crack, finish it off and let it cool down. And then we're gonna make our uh, pyramids. Due to the magic of television, a lot of things are gonna be ready for you in advance. So you will get to see how the final product look, even if you're not cooking live with us, just to make sure that you don't have to wait. So um, the first, as I, like I said, the first thing we're gonna be working with is the matzo crack. Now matzo crack is one of those great recipes that work whether you're gluten intolerant and then for you need to eat gluten-free matzos or whether you're eating regular matzos and enjoying Passover, you know, like, like most of the people. So we're gonna get started with five sheets of matzo and a baking sheet that's covered in either parchment paper or reusable silicone mat. You can use both, but I find parchment paper is just a little bit easier to, to get rid of afterwards. Um, and with silicone mat, you will have to clean a little bit and matzo crack tends to be sticky. So we're gonna show you guys. So first thing we're gonna do is, sorry about that. Uh, so we're gonna get, um, get our, we're gonna get started with our matzo crack. So we're gonna get started with five of our matzo sheets. Regular, this is absolutely regular matzo. There's nothing fancy about it. You don't have to go get eggless, extra thin, whatever you have will do. I've done this, like I said, with gluten-free. I've done this with regular, whatever works for you. And it takes about five sheets to fill a, uh, to fill a sheet, a baking sheet. So what you're gonna need to kind of fill in the cracks by breaking the matzo and completing this. So it takes usually around five sheets. 
And if you have holes that you need to fill, don't worry, just break, break those sheets up and fill those holes. It's all going to get covered with toffee mixture. So it's barely going to be noticeable. Okay. So you're just going to cover a baking sheet with matzo. And we're going to set it aside. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make our, our um, caramel mixture to or toffee mixture, as you like to call it. So you're going to need, you're going to need a, a saucepan, simple saucepan. And we're going to use a, equal quantities of brown sugar. It can be dark brown sugar or light brown sugar, whatever you have on hand, and butter. So I'm using one cup of each, but if you are making a smaller batch, like let's say you're halving it, just half the ingredients, that's fine. Make sure you're keeping equal quantities, okay? So the first thing, we're, so the first thing we're gonna do is add the butter, and then we're gonna add all of our sugar, okay? Now, this is gonna go on our stovetop for about five minutes, for about three minutes. We're going to put it on the stovetop and we're going to kind of move on with our recipe while this comes to, to a temperature. And I'm going to show you guys the stages as it cooks, okay? So we put it on our stovetop. And we're going to set it to medium heat. So you're looking for about medium flame. You don't want to scorch your butter and sugar. Just, just medium is fine, okay? Now, um, while that's cooking, we're actually gonna get started with our um, chocolate, with our date balls. So like I said, that's gonna take a few minutes and we're gonna show you guys the uh, date ball process. So for the date balls, um, I mentioned in the recipes that you either need to soak your dates or use, um, or if your dates are really, really fresh, you may, wanna, you, you may not need to. I really like to use medjool dates. So you can get Israeli medjool dates in Costco. You can buy um, natural, like natural delights medjool dates in Metro at all the stores, but really medjool dates, which are soft and juicy and they're actually fresh as opposed to dried work the best. So I, I really, really strongly recommend you use medjool dates for this. You're gonna need two cups of medjool dates measured out. And you're gonna put the, and so what, like I said, I've already processed mine in the food processor, but really what I recommend is soaking your medjool dates in warm water for about 10 minutes until they're really, really soft. And then, uh, and then processing them in the food processor. If you're finding that they're not getting really, really fine on their own, add a little bit of water. Start with one teaspoon at a time and see until you get that nice soft consistency. So, um, so just all this is, is two cups of processed medjool dates in a food processor. I've been asked before if, uh, if you can make this with, with a blender and you can, but you really need a high powered blender. So to make it like a lot easier, you really need a food processor. So if you have a Vitamix or a Ninja or a Blendtec, you probably can make this in the, in the blender. But if you're dealing with like most home people with most home cooks, you have, you know, your Oster blender or something like that, it's probably not going to cut it and you do need a food processor. So obviously if you're processing your, your dates in the food processor, they're already going to be here, but mine have been processed before. And we've used this, this food processor. So I'm going to transfer them to my blender. And now I'm actually, and now I'm going to add my, um, my coconut oil to kind of make sure that they're, that they're refined. So this is four tablespoons of coconut oil. You can use regular oil. You don't have to use coconut oil. You can use canola oil, vegetable oil, all that's fine. Just don't, uh, don't use, I don't know, don't, don't you, you can even use butter, by the way, you can even use butter if you're not keeping, if you're not keeping it vegan or uh, dairy free, you can use butter. So really any oil will do. If you're using butter, I recommend just kind of bringing it to room temperature, but um, I've always made this with, with oil. 
All that needs to do is just soften your dates further and make sure that they're malleable. So once I've added in the oil, I'm just gonna process this a couple of minutes. You can see. So really that's all it takes is just one minute of blending and we have a cohesive coconut and date batter, coconut oil, sorry, not coconut. Now to this, I'm gonna add an equal amount of milk. You can use any, any dairy or non-dairy milk that you like. I've had great results making this with almond milk, soy milk, regular milk, like really whatever, oat milk, whatever you want. Coconut milk will give you a super rich consistency. So if you wanna go for the extra oomph, you can also use coconut milk. So this is four tablespoons and just a quick process. It really kind of helps make it super, super creamy. Now to this, we're gonna add one and a half cups of almond, of ground almonds. Now I'm using literally the ground almond flour that you can buy. Bob's Red Mill has it, Costco has it. There's a million of them. But if, you're, um, if you want, you can grind your own nuts. You can use hazelnuts, you can use pistachios, you can use walnuts, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be super, super fine, like, uh, like almond meal. It can have a bit of consistency, a bit of texture. So it's really just up to you how, how the, the finer it is, the creamier your, um, your nut balls are going to be. And then we're going to use two thirds cup of, um, of cocoa powder. Now, the kind of cocoa powder you use does matter. You want to use Dutch, uh, du like you want to use uh, Dutch double processed um, coconut powder. Co sorry, cocoa powder, not coconut powder. It's much, much nicer and much finer and the taste is much richer. Don't, you know, but obviously in a pinch, whatever you have at home will do. You just want to make sure that it's, uh, it's like a good cocoa powder, I would recommend. And then finally, the other ingredient is rum or, or vanilla extract. Now, rum extract, this one is the clubhouse imitation rum extract. You can even use real brandy or real rum if that's what you have on hand. My favorite is real brandy or rum as opposed to vanilla extract. Don't worry about the percentage of alcohol is going to be completely negligible. No child will be able to tell that there was if you're using real brandy. But it just gives it this nice, rich flavor. And, um, and growing up in Israel, chocolate date balls always had that, uh, that rum extract smell. So for me, this just connects me straight to my childhood growing up in Israel. And I don't, I don't make my date balls without using a little bit of uh, rum extract. And now a, just a pinch or two of salt. Doesn't matter what salt you use, sea salt will give you, um, like flaky sea salt will give you really good results, but it can be any, any salt. So now that we've added all that, we're just gonna give this a final processing. Little cameo from this? mom. Sorry? You have a little cameo in the background. Yes, yeah. This is our my assistant Rachel. She's gonna say hi to you guys. Hi. We're just checking on the sugar and butter mixture. So we are we're good. This is the consistency you guys want. So as you can see, it's not overly, overly fine. It's pretty nice. There's, I'll show you. There's some definite texture to it, but it's been completely blended. There are no, and you can finish it with a, with a spatula. Now this is going to go into your fridge to cool for anywhere from an hour to two hours, you can leave it overnight. If you leave it overnight, you will probably have to bring it to room temperature a little bit, but um, like just make sure that you cool it and don't try to work with it from, uh, from like freshly made. So now 
the butter. So now our butter and sugar are melting, but it's still not fully cooked. So I'm gonna give it some help. I need a, I need a spatula. I'm gonna give it a little bit of help and stir it up. But you really wanna continue cooking this until your sugar and butter have completely melted. When your butter has completely melted, only then are you gonna start counting the timer of the three minutes. And you're really gonna watch it at that point. But for now, you need to make sure that it just, um, it's completely melted. We're gonna leave our spatula there. I'm actually gonna increase my heat tiny. Now, make sure if you're making toffee at home, you do wanna check up on it. You don't wanna end up in a situation where you have scorched caramel in your, in your um, in your, sorry, in your saucepan, because not much is gonna salvage that. You're gonna have to start from scratch. So just kind of keep an eye on it. Now, we're gonna get back to my chocolate date balls. Like I said, after the magic of television, we already have some chilled balls, right? And I'm gonna show you guys how we process them. So uh, we're gonna need, um, so, I like to roll my chocolate date balls in two things, coconut, shredded coconut and, uh, and powdered sugar. You can also use pistachios, ground pistachios. You can use ground walnuts. All those are gonna be totally fine. It's just about having like something on the outside. I've used, my son loves it when I use uh, sprinklers, sprinkles, not sprinklers, that would be hard to grind. Um, so you can use sprinkles, you can use uh, walnuts, you can eat, but today I'm going to show you guys just simple, basic coconut and, um, and ground wall and uh, sorry, coconut and powdered sugar. So I'm going to put it down here and I'm going to take off my rings because it gets a little messy and you don't want to end up with uh, chunks of sugar. Now I'm going to show you guys as I'm working. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure. So I'm gonna take my hands and I'm gonna wet them slightly. Sorry. Um, so you, want, you wanna wet your hands slightly, make sure that your hands are clean, right? I have a little bit of dates. So then you take a bit of your date and you put about this much. So it needs to be like a little ping pong like a little ping pong, right? Not too big because it's gonna be hard to eat and not too tiny because you still wanna have some structure. So once you start with one type of filling, you wanna to stick to it until you've made the sufficient amount. So I'm starting with coconut and I'm just gonna roll it. Now, the finer your coconut is, the easier this rolling is gonna be. My coconut's actually quite big, quite um, chunky but it's still gonna work. So um, you roll it in your coconut and then, um, and then next one. So we're gonna do a few balls. And while that's happening, I'm gonna roll a few in coconut. You can set them aside on your plate as you're continuing to work with the same filling. Now, this, the, these tend to be, honestly, most people's favorite of the three. I know that, you know, it's so, it looks so, so easy, but it really, they really pack a punch. And what people tend to love about them is that they can be made vegan, they can be dairy-free without any issues. Um, there's really no, like, there's no end to how versatile they are. You can make them very, they're super child-friendly, kids love them. So if you use sprinkles, they tend to go crazy over them. Oh, another nice coating is toasted sesame. Um, it like it looks really pretty. And then now I've made these before with uh, for like not for Passover. You can make them. Uh, the Israeli version has crushed crackers, crushed cookies in them, crushed petit beurre, uh, petit beurre crackers, cookies. But you can use any crushed cookies in them. And it pretty much is the same thing. If you want that recipe, tell Maria and I will send it to you. It's not available on my website because it was actually developed for a PJ library workshop. So 
we're gonna do a few. I'm just gonna make about five or six with the coconut and then the same amount with the icing sugar. And the reason that you really wanna stick to the same coating is because as you can see, it's a messy job. So if you don't wanna be constantly washing your hands or if you don't want shreds of coconut on the outside of your beautiful sesame balls, uh, date ball, like sesame roll date balls, then you really wanna kind of stick to one filling. So I'm gonna wash my hands and then transfer the clean ones to a platter. I like to remove any kind of really sticky errant coconut. I'm gonna show you guys what it looks like in a second. So I'm gonna set this aside. Oh, one more. We don't want to leave our little orphan. Oh, I can hear my mixture bubbling. So I want to show you guys what it looks like when it starts to bubble. So you're really seeing the, the butter. And once it comes in contact with the brown sugar, it starts to kind of billow and become almost cloud-like, like a like imagine if you've ever made honeycomb, it kind of looks like that. Like when you add the baking soda and you get this explosion of nice brown um, butter and sugar. So we're, this is now you're going to start kind of watching your timer for about three minutes. And we're in three minutes, we're going to check and I'm going to show you guys what it looks like. But as you can see right now, it's still just a mix in th three minutes. It's going to really cloud. It's going to really billow like a cloud and look more spongy and it's gonna come apart from the walls. So for now, it goes back for three minutes. And in three minutes, we're gonna check up on it. Meanwhile, we're gonna continue finishing uh, rolling our uh, chocolate date balls. So now we take again about a ping pong sized thing. And with when working with powdered sugar, I like to roll them first, like actually shape them first and only then roll them because powdered sugar is super, super sticky. And you're gonna, if you start like rolling each ball, you're gonna end up with, um, with seeing the, like you're gonna end up with date paste on the outside of your beautiful, pristine white balls. And we don't, we don't really want that. Obviously it's not irreparable. What I would then do is just kind of give them a second coating with sugar. But I just like to, usually it's pretty easy to roll the amount you want and then uh, come back to it. So, like I said, we're gonna do about six. So we're gonna do about six and then we're gonna get this out of the way. I'm gonna wash my hands. I'm gonna wash my hands and, um, and show you guys what happens when you roll this out. So you're gonna really like just roll it in the icing sugar, try to keep it away from the other balls. We can throw it a little bit on top. One sec, show you. Great. I can hear my butter, sugar mixture, cooking in the background. Like I said, you really wanna make sure, I happen to have a second person in the kitchen, which is very helpful. But um, if you're doing this all alone and you're rushing through all the recipes, just kind of keep, che keep checking on it because you really don't wanna end up in a situation that you have burnt sugar. It's, it's not gonna taste good. And like I said, you will have to throw all that out. Now, I promised you guys that I would tell you a little bit about my background. So as I said, my family, um, I, I was born in the former Soviet Union, specifically in Russia, in Yekaterinburg, Russia. My family is of Ukrainian and Belarusian descent, but as you may or may not know, in the former Soviet Union, all that didn't matter, you were just a Jew, and that's kind of how, how it stayed. So um, we grew up in a very traditional Soviet household where any mention of Judaism or holidays was pretty much unheard of. There was no synagogue, nobody went to a synagogue. Nobody did any of that. Um, you just, you just kind of stayed with the family. So when we immigrated, when we immigrated to, uh, 
to Israel in 92 after the collapse, really the, um, the encounter with religion and tradition was a huge shock. My family had no idea about what any of the holidays meant. Nothing was clear to them. All the, all the stuff they had to learn from scratch. And I distinctly remember my first Passover as being like a very shocking experience because all of a sudden I discovered that I had extended family that has been in Israel for generations and that they, you know, they had all these traditions that I knew nothing about and that were beautiful to look at. And they really made the holidays extra, extra special. So I remember my first Passover as being this really beautiful experience where my parents finally bought us new clothes. If you ever immigrated, you know that money on new clothes is not something you come by easily. So for Passover, Passover still remains probably my favorite holiday and the one I celebrate more often, most often. Um, so if you're serving this, I actually recommend, and you kind of, and they're all white, I actually recommend showing them on a dark, on a dark plate. And uh, maybe at the end, we can transfer them to a dark plate and show you what they look like. And um, because right now they're like, it's very white, but if you're making a mix, some, some pistachios, some walnuts, it, it doesn't super matter what, um, what plate you're showing it on. Give me one sec. I see, I'm, I'm seeing that the camera feels a little bit dirty to me. And I hope that this, this is cleaner. Yeah, I, to me, it looks cleaner. Okay, so when you do enough of these, your camera ends up splattered with uh, butter and chocolate. No, no, this is not, uh, not done. No, it's not done. Um, so like we just checked on the butter sugar, it still needs uh, to come a little bit to a billowing consistency. I'm actually gonna increase my, my heat a little bit and give my butter sugar a bit of, oh, perfect. Yeah. Really in about a minute, I'm gonna show you guys. So um, we're gonna trans we're gonna now continue with the matzo crack. So now I'm noticing that my matzo, so as you matzos, if you move them from place to place, you're gonna end up with little gaps in them. So you really, before you pour the the toffee mixture on, you wanna make sure all these gaps are closed. Now, if you want, you can kind of add more to really fill your sheet. It's up to you. So I'm going to show you guys what it starts to look like. It starts to really kind of cloud. I'm going to give this one more. So this, this is pretty much ready. So it starts to be really powdered. So I'm going to pour it now on my sheets now if you uh follow me on social media and it's immigrants table on instagram on facebook in the next few days you're actually going to see the video of how to make this recipe but you can find all the stage by stage uh photos if you're ever unsure of how something is supposed to look like you can find all the three recipes we're doing today you can find them on the blog so don't be don't be shy go on the blog check it out so once you've poured the um the butter sugar Mix on the matzo. You want to spread it. I'm going to spread it as much as possible so that it covers, it really needs to cover all your matzos. And then we're going to put it in the oven to bake going to put it for about 15 minutes at either 325 or 350. This one is three. I start with 325 and, uh, and take it from there. And if I'm seeing like usually 325 is more than enough, there's no need to increase the heat. Um, and today, if you're doing both recipes we're, we're making today, they're both at either 325 or 350. So like I said, I start both on 325 and then if need be, I increase the heat. So now that your uh, butter is, butter sugar mix is pretty spread out. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. 
Uh -uh. Wonderful. Now we're gonna we're gonna put this in the oven at 325 for 15 minutes. Okay. So 15 minutes, and after 15 minutes, we're gonna spread our our chocolate chips. We're gonna and we're gonna put our toppings. So for now, we're gonna forget about it. Let it go for 15 minutes. We're gonna move on to our macaroon pyramids. So meanwhile, so for the macaroon pyramids, um, we're gonna need shredded coconut. You wanna make sure you're using, so you want sweetened shredded coconut. So if the coconut you have is unsweetened, so like for the dead balls, it doesn't matter if your coconut is sweetened or not, but for this, you want a sweetness. So if, you're, um, if your coconut, you need two cups of sweetened shredded coconut. If your coconut is not sweetened, just use the same amount of unsweetened and add uh, one tablespoon per cup to sweeten it. One tablespoon of regular sugar, you can use powdered, doesn't, doesn't particularly matter. So we're gonna do, um, we're gonna use, uh, for this, we're gonna use a mixer. You can use a handheld mixer or you can use a standing KitchenAid or stand, any standing mixer. It doesn't really matter. It goes faster with a standing mixer, but like your, your handheld mixer is gonna work just fine. So I'm gonna get started first on mixing my uh, coconut. So we're gonna mix our coconut with um, condensed milk with half a cup of condensed milk. So like I said, two cups of, uh, of shredded um, coconut and half a cup of condensed milk. So this creates this nice, so you wanna use a spatula to kind of help get it out. So um, condensed milk is definitely something that I'm bringing from uh, from my my house back in the in Russia to this. So for for a while growing up, condensed milk was basically the only sweet thing that we had. Um, so the dessert, the typical dessert for a Russian kid, was either bread with a little bit of butter and sugar, or bread with condensed milk. It was delicious, and I don't know if Maria, you can back me up on this. If you if that was a dessert in your household as well. But uh, for me, it was, a, it was definitely a favorite. We're gonna add a little bit of vanilla extract. You can't really see fully, but it's gonna go in there. So it's a half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. You can go crazy and add a full teaspoon. I won't tell, it's gonna taste good. We would sip um, it straight out of the can. Yeah, yeah, you can, eat the, you can eat the condensed milk straight out of the can. I think my mom was trying to be nutritious when she put it on bread but I'm, I'm not sure how nutritious you are when you're eating bread with condensed milk. So we're, we're just mixing up straight up, just straight mixing with a spatula. Again, if you're using a standing mixer, you can do the whole thing in a standing mixer um, and you can just use the, um, you don't need, just use the, the dough hook or um, the, the, the stirring, like the stirring hook as opposed to the uh, whipping hook for mixing this. But I find that if you're doing the whole thing in a standing mixer, you have to wash the, the receptacle really, really well before you whip the eggs. And I, I, I'm not one for thorough washing in the middle of a recipe. So I like to get started in a, in a, in a bowl and then move on to the mixer when I'm working with the, with the whip. Now, I'll show you guys the consistency. It's really, it's just kind of making sure that your coconut is moist and Nice. And we're going to set this aside and rinse my hands. Now, again, thanks to the magic of television, we're not starting with a, with a clean egg white. You can really see egg white. Egg. We've already whipped this, but I'm going to have to re-whip it because what happens when you let um, whip egg white stand is that they start to weep or bleed, however you want to call it. But essentially, they're starting to secrete the sun they're starting to secrete a little bit of uh, liquid and it's um you want to re like kind of re revitalize it show you guys
too much. So, now if you were whipping, I'm just going to tell you, if you were whipping egg whites from scratch, you start at, uh, at a medium speed and you increase the speed as you go. So it doesn't, you don't start straight up at like 10, five or 10, whatever the speed of your mixer is, but you kind of start in medium and then you go. Now this can take anywhere between five and 10 minutes, but the goal is that you can turn your bowl over, over your head, anywhere you want, and those egg whites don't move, right? They need to stay firmly in place. They haven't moved. That means that your egg whites are stiff, okay? So once you've reached that, you can, you can proceed. So now we're gonna, uh, fold our whipped egg whites into our coconut. So I'm going to show you guys. So we take back the coconut and we're going to very gently transfer our egg whites without breaking them. So you really want to make sure this cloudiness stays and you're going to fold it into the shredded coconut. Now people I remember the first time I heard the concept of folding something and I freaked out because I was like, what? Fold clothes, you don't fold food. How the hell am I supposed to fold egg whites? <laughs> There's no folding here. So if this, is, um, if this is your first time hearing this concept, I'm gonna explain. So really what you're doing is you're actually folding everything around the egg whites. You're doing this motion that goes like this and you fold over top. So one and fold over top. Some people do figure eights that works just as well. So imagine you're drawing a figure eight with your spatula or you're folding. So I'm gonna fold. And what you're essentially doing is you're trying to prevent all that beautifully aerated egg white and the volume we've built into the egg whites. You're trying to prevent that from deflating. Now, obviously it's gonna look like it's disappeared because it's just gonna fold into my coconut mixture. But in fact, it doesn't disappear. It binds with the coconut. And then when you bake it, it's kind of, it's what gives this dessert its structure. So if you've ever made meringues, this is really almost all there is to meringue. Meringue is just sugar and whipped egg whites. And the better your um, egg whites are, the nicer your meringues or your coconut pyramids are going to be. So I'm really, I wanna make sure that I fold this very, very well. So as you can see, one, two, one, two. Again, because we're not chatting, but this is a, a webinar, I have no idea what your level of expertise is in the kitchen. So excuse me if, if what I'm saying is preaching to, you know, to the experts, but in case this is your first time, there's no shame. It was everybody's first time once upon a time or just yesterday, you know, in the case of my son, he made his first batch of cookies last week. So there's always, there's always a first step. Um, the first time I made these was a few years ago when I was working uh, with JDC and Twine, which is kind of known as the Jewish, um, the Jewish first point of response in a crisis. They tend to be the joint JDC and Twine. They are very familiar to, again, former Soviet uh, emigres because they, they're the ones that did a lot of the evacuation back in the late 80s, um, before the, back in the 80s, in the late 70s, before the former Soviet Union opened up, it was JDC and Twine or the joint that did a lot of the escapees um, and dealt with the refused. So um, I worked with JDC and Twine, and Twine is their, young, is their younger branch, but JDC is the, is the older. So I worked with JDC and Twine on a Passover cookbook, which you can usually, which you can find on their website. It's called Reordered. And it's a different way of doing a Seder. And this was one of the recipes that we developed for them. Um, the principle of the reordered cookbook is that it deals with Jewish recipes from all over the world. So um, this was from Ashkenazi Jewish, from the former Soviet Union. So now that we folded our egg whites into our coconut, it's a cohesive, it's a completely cohesive mixture. 
we want to make sure, again, we wash our hands before we deal with, um, with pyramids. So we're going to wash our hands, quick break. I think by the time the pandemic ends, uh, the pandemic ends, ended, I don't think it's ended, by the time the pandemic ends, we're all going to be experts on washing our hands. There's not going to be any need to explain how to wash hands to anyone. So um, now we're going to try and I try to form the pyramids as I go, but you can also fix them kind of after you've put them on the baking sheet. So to form a pyramid, I take a batch and I'm going to show you and I try to mold it into a pyramid, especially if you find you have hair on your hands. It's fantastic. I try to shape it into a pyramid as I work. So I'm going to show you guys. So this is kind of looking like a triangle and I just try to give it this shape in my hand. So almost like a hamantashen. And then when I transfer it, I try to kind of over, -exaggerate, over exaggerate the tip and, and put them like this. So I'm gonna show you guys a few of them. And then again, due to the magic of television, we already happen to have them ready-made. So as you're making them, um, you're going to want to wash your hands a few more times because clean hands make this so much neater. So again, you're folding them. And then when you folded them, you kind of fix it up a little bit. So they look like nice little mounds. Try to keep your... And the, the more, um, the better whipped your egg whites are going to be the nicer and stiffer your pyramids are going to be. And the, last the less chance of them kind of disintegrating or becoming clumps on your baking sheet. So full disclosure, trying to make this with my daughter, with my infant daughter in my arms yesterday was not very conducive and stress-free environment. So my first batch at making these yesterday turned out to be complete clumps. So they don't, they don't really look like pyramids. But actually something you can fix if that happens to you if you take them out of the of the oven and you discover that your pyramids have kind of clamped slumped a little bit you can take a butter knife and um and prop them up a little bit when they first come out of the oven they're actually going to be super super malleable so you can kind of help them a little bit the better whipped your egg whites are the more they'll keep their shape um, so, so kind of the easy, the more you do the work in advance, uh, the easier it's going to be to take them out later. They're actually, by the time we're done making these little pyramids, we're going to have our batch coming out of the oven of the matzo crack. So everything is going to be going pretty smooth. So like I said, you're going to have to wash your hands a few times by this, by this time, my hands are pretty covered in mixture. So I have to wash them. Otherwise, like I said, it's just not going to make the neatest pyramids. Now, you absolutely do not have to shape them into pyramids. If you're finding this too finicky, if you don't see the point, obviously the pyramids are meant to relate to the story of uh, leaving Egypt. Um, but if you just want to do, you know, little macaroon clumps, that's totally fine. You can use uh, an ice cream scoop. You can use spoons to just kind of dump them, like just do this, dump them, and it's going to be fine. You can tap the top a little bit. So you still would keep the same, the exact same recipe, but you just don't have to shape them into finicky little pyramids. And I'm going to show you guys what these triangles look like. So now I'm at my last. So a batch of two cups usually makes about eight pyramids you can make them smaller you can make them bigger and then you know win get two more if you make them really small but i i like to just do eight and it tends to be enough but of course if you're making this to a big bat to to a big group if you have a big family again having being from the former soviet union we do not have a big family but uh, this year we're actually we're actually hosting uh because you could finally host we're hosting um, friends of ours with children who don't have other people to do the Seder with. So we're going to be a pretty international bunch. There's going to be me, my husband, my Colombian husband, then my sister, her Venezuelan husband. And then we have a former Czech Jew from Germany coming. 
then we have uh, for, uh, Brazilian Jews coming. So it's going to be a very, very immigrant mix. So you can probably see some of the dishes if you follow me on Instagram. So like I said, I want to show you guys what they look like. We shaped little triangle pyramids. Choo -choo -choo. Yeah. So these are ready to go into the oven. And at the same time, we're going to take our matzo crack out. So hold on a sec. I'm just going to set this aside. So we're going to take this, put them in the oven. Your oven, you can increase the oven to 350 or you can keep it at 325. 325 will leave you with like nice whitish pyramids. 350 will, will leave you with like golden brown pyramids. So it's really up to you. Now, we're gonna take our matzo crack and I'm gonna show you guys what it looks like. So as you can see, the, the toffee has really kind of caked. I don't, I don't recommend touching it. I have hands of steel from baking a lot, but you know, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend touching it. It's almost like a crackling top and it re tastes really, really good. So now what you want to do is you want to add, sorry, we're going to add our, um, I want to make sure you can actually see the, the matzah. We're going to add our chocolate on top. Try to spread your chocolate chips as much as possible to save yourself the work of the spatula afterwards. And we're gonna let this cool down for five minutes because what's gonna happen is the heat of the toffee is naturally gonna melt down the chocolate chips and then you'll be able to spread them. Now you can use high quality dark chocolate as opposed to chocolate chips, but um, it won't, doesn't spread as nicely. So chocolate chips are actually chunk of chocolate that have been preserved with uh, fat added to them. So usually it's, it's non-dairy, like some one non-dairy oil or other. And I don't know if you can see, but already as we're talking, the chocolate chips are melting. So, but perhaps by the time I'm done giving you guys this spiel, uh, we're gonna be ready to, to spread the chocolate. So um, if you're using, so it's actually good to really use chocolate chips for this as opposed to nice high quality chocolate because it's gonna be glossy. It's gonna spread really nicely. You don't have to worry about tempering your chocolate or all that jazz. Now you can make toffee crack by just doing these two stages and then topping a little bit of sea salt on top. Uh, sorry, not sea salt, flaky sea salt. So something like Maldon sea salt, or um, I'll show you guys the one I kind of use. Again, this is not an advert. It's just, I tend to like it. Salt work. This is, um, this is from Iceland. This is salt from Iceland. But Malden sea salt, which is widely available. You can find it in Costco. You can find it in a lot of places. It works beautifully and it flakes much nicer than if you just use table sea salt. So really do the toffee crack, add the chocolate, and then a little bit of flakiness of sea salt, a, fl a flake or like a sea salt. You want to see the sea salt flakes. And it's beautiful. If you're serving that to adults, you don't need all the extra things on top. Honestly, I find it gilding the lily a little bit. But if you're serving it for kids, then dark chocolate and sea salt is not, not such a hit. <laughs> so um, that's what we're going to show you guys, the, the toppings. But really, if you're doing this for adults, the, the, the toffee, chocolate, sea salt, you're done. You don't need more. Um, so let me see. I'm going to see if my chocolate spreads a little bit. Yeah, and it's already spread. So see, while we're, while we're yakking away, this chocolate does its job. So you're going to end up with quite a lot of chocolate by the time I'm done spreading it. So we're going to come back and fill all these holes. Don't worry. And I always find it amazing how chocolate melts. So as we're talking, it's gonna keep melting. Like chocolate melts and it's like there was nothing solid here before and it's shiny and stunning. Now, if you were using real chocolate, like high quality chocolate as opposed to, well, not that chocolate chips are not real chocolate, but as opposed to chocolate chips, you would have had to temper your chocolate to kind of get this glossiness. With high quality chocolate chips, you do not need to temper. Now I'll tell you guys that when I made um, a few, so, sometimes when I made when I've made this, I didn't have the best chocolate chips. I just had you know 
like whatever store box or no name brand of milk chocolate chips and it's not very nice so the higher quality your chocolate chips are the better this is going to be so really try to get nice chocolate chips dark chocolate chips these are um from bulk barn i love using the costco ones i don't even remember what the no, no, the Costco is not Kirkland. It's a, uh, well, yeah, they have the Kirkland one, but I tend to buy the yellow one. I don't remember what, no, I, I don't remember what it's called because I'm out of it, but um, you can, uh, like the Costco ones work fine. The Costco brand, the Kirkland brand are fine, but I like the, the yellow ones. I just don't remember what the brand is called. If anybody remembers, Chip it. thank you. Yeah, so Chip it is actually totally fine for this. And, um, and I like to use them. Um, and I love, I love the dark chocolate chippets. So if you're going to be splurging, that one is worth a splurge. They're actually really nice. So we're spreading the, I don't want to lose any of my delicious chocolate. So as you can see, covered my sheet with chocolate. Any place I have extra, I'm going to go and fill these corners. I don't want anything to be left without chocolate. Excess in chocolate is the name of the game here. Oh, and this is one cup of chocolate chips. Yeah, I was like, pretty sure it's one cup. And um, one cup of chocolate chips. So remember your quality, your quantities of cho sugar, chocolate chip, and butter are equal. It's the golden trifecta. And it's about um, four, five matzo sheets. That, that part is going to vary. So um, now we're going to top our matzo sheets. I don't want to lose any of this chocolate. So really just do this with clean hands and add it. It's delicious and you don't want to miss it. And if you're, if you have chocoholics coming to your Seder, like I do, this is always a hit. So I'm going to wash my hands. I feel like honestly, like the last two years, a broken record. Wash your hands, wash your hands. So wash your hands, wash your hands a lot. So now we're gonna do our toppings. Um, like I said, adults go with flaky sea salt, you're good. But if you wanna get fancy, some of my favorite toppings um, for Passover are gonna be pistachios, crushed pistachios. The sprinkles that your son is gonna, your, your kids, your son, your daughter, whatever, they're gonna love them. Coconut, oh, I already started <laughs> putting the coconut. Coconut, and the other side. And this, this one is, is a surprise. I love, love, love um, salty potato chips on top of this. It's delicious. Now, if you're not doing this for Passover or, you know, and you're not concerned, or if you're using, uh, you can also find these, by the way, kosher for Passover sometimes, pretzels. Crushed pretzels work really, really well. Again, it's that sweet, salty combination, which actually makes things taste sweeter. It's really nice. So what we're going to do is, well, I started with the coconut. Let me show you guys. So we're going to continue with the coconut. It fell a little bit. So we're going to work with a clump and we're going to top it pretty generously with our chosen topping. Uh, now, if you can visibly see kind of the edges of your matzo sheet, try to stick to them because it's going to make cutting it a little bit fat easier afterwards. So this is, and leave it, just leave it put. Now next is going to be the sprinkles. And I know that these are going to be a hit. So I'm making quite a lot making a big group. And again, depending on what you know is going to be, I need a bit more, depending on what you know are going to be the most popular ones, um, those you kind of want to, to put the bigger sheet with them. So like this is a whole matzo sheet of sprinkles. Which I'm not into, but I'm taking this to my son's daycare and they're going to be into it. Then my favorite, with, um, except sea salt, is pistachio. So I'm going to do a lot of pistachios too. So... You can crush your pistachios um, in a Ziploc bag with, with a rolling pin, or you can do it in a food processor. It doesn't really matter. They don't have to be super, super fine. And 
and can that do that. Then potato chips, which are not like, not everybody loves them, but my husband and I love them. He loves the sweet and salty. So I do those. Again, for the adults, I'm going to do the flaky sea salt. And I'm actually going to leave a tiny little square just as it is with just crack with the, the matzo crack, sorry, with the toffee and uh, chocolate. Because sometimes simple is actually quite good. I'm just going to move the chocolate chip, the potato chips a little bit. Can hear that my uh, my child has woken up, which has valiantly slept through this. So kudos to them, but now they will come. So um, so I'm gonna show you guys. This is what it looks like. This is gonna go into your fridge to cool down for uh, let's start with two hours, and it can literally be uh, overnight. You can like forget about it, leave it overnight, whatever works. We're just uh, melting the chocolate. Um, so this is going to go into your fridge. But I'm going to show you guys what it looks like after a stay in the fridge. So again, due to the magic of television, we have a batch already ready. So we're going to, like I said, you want to, ideally, you actually use parchment paper because it's much, much easier to get rid of. Because what happens to the bottom of your sheet is that it looks like that. So I'm going to show you guys. So we take this. So, so we take this. Um, then we slide it off our parchment paper. You can get, cut it on top of the parchment paper as well. It's not a big deal. And then you just use a sharp knife to cut it. See? Hear that satisfying crack? Now, obviously, this is half the amount of what we did today. I just wanted to show you guys, this is hot. This is half the amount. So they're gonna break and that's totally fine. Um, these ones, this is actually made with gluten-free matzo. So it's much, much crumblier. But if you're using regular matzo, it doesn't break as easily. So gluten-free one will break much more easily. So I end up with more uneven pieces. But um, regular matzo is doesn't break as well. Doesn't break not, not as well because you actually don't want it to break. Doesn't break as much. So you're gonna when you're done cutting them, they look like this. So I'm gonna put them on a plate. Okay, I'm gonna put them on a plate. Actually, I'll show you something else. I'll show you a different presentation. I'm gonna show you what they would look like if I was really serving them. So kind of an elegant presentation for something very, very simple. So I like to treat them because they're, they're cracks or cracked, uh, cracked uh, I like to think of it as cracked rocks. And I'll tell you guys an honest story is that um, when I made these and published them on my site, um, I actually had somebody write to me about something I've never thought of. They said that um, the use, calling these matzo crack, which you know I think is cute because I think of cracked rocks, is actually quite triggering for people. So if you or have a loved one that uh, has dealt with addiction, the joke of matzo crack may not seem so funny. So I'm actually always careful and I try to, to kind of remind people that you know it's meant to be Boy, let's see, this fell apart a little bit. That it's actually meant to talk about crack the rock. But again, it's just something to be mindful of. So all these extras, I'm obviously not going to throw out. I'm going to eat them. But uh, if you're serving them, and you're going to have more of them made, they can be served on like a slate board like this. And you can use... Um, mint leaves or things like that to kind of give it a nicer presentation. So there's your matzo crack, cracked and ready. And 
promised you guys I would show you what the 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 balls can look like as well. So I usually so it's very organized, but sometimes I tend to kind of kind of pile them a little bit. I like to go for but I don't know, more rustic presentations, but and then you have the contrast with the, the wood or you can do it on a dark plate if you have it. And then you just kind of use a, a pastry brush to clean it a little bit and make sure that you don't have. Um... So this is going to be your, uh, if you're serving the, the balls, it doesn't have to be on a plate. It can be on a cutting board like this. Now, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to drizzle our uh, pyramids with a little bit of melted chocolate and then our desserts are done. So like I said, we made the pyramids in advance. Okay, and in four minutes, actually our oven ones are gonna be ready, but they're not because when they come out of the oven, they really, you really need to wait, um, wait anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes before you touch them. And then you can even transfer them to a cookie rack to dry further, like for another half an hour. I, I find that like, you wanna be careful and let them really, really cool down. So um, this is just, these are chocolate chips melted. You can use regular chocolate here. It doesn't have to be chocolate chips. This, this doesn't matter. So you just take, and you wanna work on a cooking drying rack or a plate that you don't care about because the chocolate is gonna go all over the place. So make sure this is not your uh, presentation platter. And you wanna make sure that you can move your pyramids because you're gonna have to transfer them out of here afterwards. So I like to do this on a cookie drying rack, uh, cookie, yeah, cookie drying rack. So the ones that are holy, make sure you put a baking sheet or something to collect the runoff chocolate under them. So I just do this. Okay. You could work individually on each one. And you really, you're gonna wanna clean your, your plate afterwards. So these, uh, these didn't, not as pyramid. -y. Oh, and if when they come out, you have a little bit of runoff egg, depending on how well you whipped your egg or how cold it was or whatever, if you have a bit of runoff egg around your pyramids, just uh, use a knife to trim it. So when it's still hot or when it's cooled down, use a knife to trim it. So now we've gone all over these and we've, um, we've done the chocolate and we're gonna let these dry further before we try to move them out of the way. And when they've dried, they're gonna look something like this. So these guys, the pyramids have crushed a little bit because the egg whites weren't whipped as well, like I said, but you can still see the triangle shapes. Sorry. See, as you can see, the chocolate runoff sticks a little bit. Now, another thing I like to do, by the way, is um, take, where's the chocolate? Sorry, I wanna show you guys. One more thing I like to do, if you're really, when you have a lot of chocolate left, you wanna take your pyramid and dip it into the chocolate, just the bottom, just the bottom. So what you end up with, and then you kind of, I take off the extra with a knife or something. And then you end up with the bottoms of the pyramids with chocolate. And these, like I said, I do them that after it's dried a little bit. And then I actually turn them over to dry with the top facing upwards. And then that really kind of hits the chocolate, the chocolate effect home. And for, for those who are real chocoholics, that's the extra hit that they need. So once again, I'm gonna show you guys the three finished desserts. Give me a sec. I'm just gonna clean my area before I show you all the three desserts together. Now, of course, you don't have to do all three. You can do, no, no, uh, you can do one, you can do two, thank you. You can do one, two, you can do them all, you can even, if you're doing this, if you're serving a platter, you can do something like this. Take your, your matzo balls and your chocolate crack and mix them up. And that's, I really like doing this. It's like a much more irreverent presentation. It looks fun. It looks inviting. 
and you have like a dessert board because for most of us, if you're, you know, some, sometimes there's a cake and then these are extra. Sometimes all you need is just little, little simple desserts like this. So this is a crack and, um, and chocolate balls. And then you have the pyramids on the side. Oh, sorry. I have more chocolate. I don't wanna. Then you have the pyramids on the side. And I'm going to be serving this at the end of my Passover meal, along with tea and coffee. Well, coffee for those uh, who need it at that time. But like I said, I have an, uh, a little bitty baby, so I have no problem sleeping. And I just go to sleep whether I drink the coffee or not. So guys, thank you so much for joining today. Do we have, Maria, do we have any questions or how are we? We're good? We are good. Barbara is saying that she's also melted chocolate in a double boiler and then rolled the balls in melted chocolate. More and more chocolate. Bring it on. So we hope that we've inspired you. This is your last chance to put in a question. But if you haven't thought of your question, you can always reach Xenia at info at immigrants table. So that's immigrants plural table. Well, it's actually a pot like it's supposed to be, uh, you know, the conjunct the belonging to an immigrant, but let's say immigrants, plural, table.com. So info at immigrants, table.com or immigrants, table on all social media. Hit me up. I'll, I, I respond to all the messages. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Xenia. I know I feel inspired. Barbara is saying thank you so much. You are divine. And Aww. I think I agree. <laughs> If those of you who came in a little bit late, um, this will be up on our YouTube channel for the Coat St. Luke uh, YouTube channel. So just type in Coat St. Luke and then find Xenia's video and show your friends, show your family members and happy Passover. Happy Passover. Bye everyone. Guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.